A few months ago, my 1926 Model T began running poorly and lost power. A compression test revealed very low compression in two of the cylinders, so I needed to rebuild the top end. Now this is the first time I've done anything like this, so it was kind of intimidating, but I persevered and I discovered some very interesting things along the way. I learned some old methods and some new techniques. In this video, I will show you what I discovered when I removed the head, what decisions I made regarding authentic versus modern parts and why. Be sure to watch to the end because I discovered some surprising and unconventional things about the correct shape of redressed valve seats and about head bolt stretch. This is not a how-to video, it's more of a discussion of my thoughts and observations after having completed the project. Model T's use head bolts, not head studs. This makes removing the head pretty straightforward, provided none of the head bolts break off. I was lucky, and soon had the head off. The carbon buildup was surprising to me, but I soon learned that this is considered to be light in terms of carbon deposits. Many cars are much worse. The cause of low compression was clearly evident with the two D-shaped exhaust valves that leaked profusely. At least two new valves were in order. But since I had it all apart, I decided to rework the valve seats, replace all the valves, keepers, and springs. Bead blasting made quick work of the carbon on the head, and a few hours of scraping and Scotch-Brite cleaned up the pistons and the deck of the block. The head wasn't absolutely flat, so I had a local engine shop plane it for me, just a minimum amount. I decided to go with modern valves and split taper keepers rather than the authentic valves and pins. The valves I chose were a little bigger, which would give me more material around the seats for machining. More about this in a second. The whole valve seat shape thing proved to be very surprising. And the modern split taper keepers would eliminate the risk of failing spring retainer pins, which some people have reported from some batches of substandard remanufactured parts. Plus the modern valves were inexpensive and locally available. The valves I chose are replacements for a Chevy small block engine and the spring retainers are from a Ford 8 and tractor. Details in the description if you're interested. I used remanufactured replacement authentic Model T valve springs. Now this is interesting. While reading the original service manuals and bulletins I discovered this. Notice that Ford specified that the valve sheet should be radiused, not conical. This flies in the face of all conventional modern wisdom. I couldn't find any rebuilders who machine radius seats. It just isn't done anymore. The service manual says that this produces a hairline contact between the valve and the seat, which wears in better, seals better, and is more tolerant to carbon buildup. I guess that makes sense. In any case, since round seat cutting tools are not common, and since thousands of valve jobs have been successfully completed with modern angle seat cutters, I decided to attempt conventional three-angle seats. Now since my old valves were worn in very deep, I was going to need to remove quite a bit of material to completely reshape the valve seats. As an homage to the radius seats, I decided to make the landing of the three-angle seat very narrow thereby approximating the line contact that a radius seat would have produced. Note that I cannot just lap the valves in again like many people do. Because I was using larger valves and because the old seats were worn down so deep. There are some wonderful tools available for recutting valve seats, but my pockets just aren't that deep. I bought a set of high-speed steel valve seat cutters and it's kind of cool to be doing it just like they show in the old manuals. I was thrilled with how smoothly they cut. They worked really well. I was lucky to borrow a Sioux valve seat grinder. I used it just to touch the conical ceiling surface, just to put nice circular fine lay lines into it. I used an oversized reamer to open up the valve guides as well. I guess the guides have hardened over time because they were really tough to ream. I found this old spring compressor in my dad's things and was sure glad to have it. 
Other simpler ones are also available from the vendors, and they appear to work well too. I adjusted the valve lash to 20 thousandths and checked it again after 20 hours of running. Before installing the head, I thoroughly cleaned out all the head bolt threaded holes in the block, and I chased them with a 7 16 14 threads per inch bottoming tap. Now while inspecting the old head bolts, we noticed that some of them were stretched. And interestingly, they were stretched within the threaded portion. Upon consideration, this makes sense. They stretched at the plane of the top of the block. Since some of the thread is above this plane, and since the thread roots are a weak point in the bolt, they stretched here. I also noticed that they didn't engage the threaded holes in the block as much as I would like. So I used new grade 8 bolts that were a little longer. They were 3.5 inches long compared with 3.25 in the original ones. I made sure with the bottoming tap that they would all go in deep enough to tighten without bottoming. My choice to use grade 8 bolts rather than authentic remanufactured bolts will elicit some scorn from purists, but my car isn't going to be entered in any concours. And I'm reassured having deeper thread engagement and stronger bolts. All that was left to do was to start it, which I did without replacing the radiator just in case. And I've been driving her ever since.